I don't know about you, but when I think about nature, I often picture the countryside. I think about vast meadows full of wildflowers or dense woodlands thick with trees that harbour a multitude of different species. For me, nature can often feel like something that's far away, that I need to travel to experience. It can be hard to imagine nature as being something that's here, where I am right now. But as you can see, I am surrounded by trees and there's all kinds of different wildlife here, even though we are right in the heart of London in our very own museum gardens. Now, this area is obviously very urban. There are buildings and houses all around us and we're right next to a busy road. You can probably hear the traffic, but little pockets of green space like this can be a surprising haven for wildlife in our urban jungle. In this series, we aim to show and tell you about the nature that could be flourishing right on your doorstep. And maybe we can even inspire you to get outside and discover what's in your local area. We will take you on a journey through the seasons and give you tips on the natural wonders that you can look out for. Each episode, I'll be joined by a museum scientist who will reveal places that are surprisingly resplendent with nature. Nature that is sometimes hidden or taken for granted amongst the hustle and bustle of everyday life in a town or city. We'll discover amazing stories of survival and growth and take a closer look at the surprising biodiversity that exists in the tiniest areas that we walk past every day but often ignore. Join us as we take you through the seasonal changes. So Shituki, we're now in spring. It's traditionally a time of rebirth for the natural world. What's happening and what are some of the things we can expect to see? Yes, Emma, so spring, you know, it's my favorite season of the year. We really start to see a lot of the flowers coming in, a lot of the new shoots and leaves coming in from the trees. And a lot of the an animals are also kind of re-emerging. So throughout the winter, they've been kind of hunkering away, sheltering from the cold. And now, um, yeah, they're really starting to come in and we start to see more interactions between these plants and animals and uh, the food systems and everything else, all the ecosystem really coming back into life. Yeah, it's one of my favorite times of year. I just love seeing all the new shoots and the birds all coming out. It's like life's really rejuvenating, isn't it? It really is. And I feel like even humans um, hibernate a little bit through the winter, you know, when, when it's colder and we really start to come out, have our picnics, enjoy the sun. I see spring a lot in the flowers and the different splashes of color that we see through the different species of flowers. And um, kind of the early species that we start to see are the crocuses, the daffodils um, in the early part of spring, early March. And um, they can sustain a little bit more of the cold. So they're really good at like coming in first. And then later we have more of the bluebells um, and the wood anemone, we have both of these plants uh, blossoming in the Natural History Museum gardens, which we're really lucky to see. And later on, we see some of the primroses and the roses blossoming as well. And actually throughout spring, all of these flowers are such an important lifeline for mm. the pollinators and the insects we have here um, in the UK. Yeah, and they look really pretty as well. I love seeing all these flowers. Now, we need to talk about trees. Trees yes. are super important, but they're also really useful for a lot of other wildlife as well, aren't they? Exactly. I have a good example actually in the gardens to show you about an um, early tree. Would you like to see? Yeah, definitely. Lead the way. Okay, let's go. So here, Emma, we have a juvenile hazel tree and you can see that it's coming in new leaves because the temperatures increase. So what happens during the winter is that um, trees such as this, obviously deciduous trees, shed their leaves over winter to conserve their energy. And through the winter, they kind of have sap and water kind of being stored in the root system. And as the temperature increases, they start to um, travel up the tree and then to, to these branches. And then um, we also have buds that are tolerant to the cold but then when the spring comes um, it bursts and then the new leaves kind of start to come out and you can see um, a bunch of new leaves in this little tree here and obviously leaves are so so important for photosynthesis as well which really is the process that's underlying a lot of the rest of the ecosystem and i think trees in general are the solid foundation of this whole habitat because 
we also see a lot of insects and of course mm. the birds that then depend on these insects really synchronizing the timing of when they're emerging during springtime to match it to when the leaves come because these birds and insects find shelter food in the berries and nuts in these trees so yeah they're really important trees yeah for sure and we've got to talk about the soil as well haven't we because soil is important throughout the year but what's going on in the soil at this time of year particularly? Yeah, so temperature again plays a key um, part in soil and soil again is one of the most diverse part of a garden ecosystem like this. There's millions and billions of microorganisms and bacteria that when the temperature is increasing they really start to increase their activity and this means that the decomposition and nutrient recycling is increasing. Mm -hmm. And this is important because we need a lot more nutrients to have this lush greenery mm -hmm. that we have here today. Yeah. So yeah, soil, again, one of the underlying key components of this garden. Yeah. So we don't want people to just appreciate the trees, they need to appreciate the soil as well. Exactly. Perfect. Now we are very lucky here, aren't we? Because we do have a pond. Mm -hmm. Shall we go and check it out? Yes, please. Excellent, let's do it. So we've got our two lovely ponds here. And now some people at home, they might have a pond in their garden or they might have a pond in a local park or a canal nearby. I know I've got a pond near where I live. What are some of the things that you know, people can look out for if they've got a water body near them? Yeah, so ponds are actually very exciting during springtime. And this is particularly because of the amphibians that then come back into the pond. So again, during the winter months, during the colder months, they're sheltering on the surrounding woodland or um, just in the banks in um, log piles, again, sheltering from the cold. When the temperature starts to increase, they come back into the water, they start to breed. So here in this pond, we're lucky to have uh, frogs, toads, as well as newts. So if you have a pond near you, you might catch a male toad hitching a ride on a female toad, uh, which is when they're mating. So, and then this kind of leads on to them having their eggs, obviously. So you can spot uh, the frog spawn different to the toad eggs. So the frog spawn, um, we have some just along the banks here and uh, they come in jelly-like clumps um, and you can spot them. And then the toad eggs are a little bit different because they're in more of like a stringy structure, kind of wrapped around foliage. So yeah, if you have a pond near you, it'll be a good chance to see whether you can spot the difference between the two as well. And of course, we also have our ducks, which have taken mm -hmm. residence yeah. into our ponds recently. <laughs> They're very cute, we all love them. And um, this is also a chance for the aquatic birds to uh, mate, breed and build their nests as well. So you might also spot some uh, goslings and ducklings in your um, walks around uh, your water body. Yeah, and speaking of birds, shall we carry on walking and see what we can find in bird life around the garden? Let's do that. Fantastic. <laughs> So this time of year, we really start to notice that change in bird species, don't we? And even as we've been walking, I've been seeing so many in the trees here. What kind of species can we see at this time of year? Yeah, so of course we have our resident species that have been around even through the harsh winter, like the pigeons, the robins, the blue tits and the great tits. So they're still around. Um, they're obviously going to get a little bit louder when it comes to the mating season and the breeding season. And loads of the birds are breeding at this time because they're trying to get use of all the energy that have been reinvested into this ecosystem. And particularly speaking about robins, um, we might hear their kind of diversity of their bird songs kind of increasing and getting louder, particularly when they're trying to um, defend their territory um, to, you know, kind of seek out the uh, females, for example. And talking also about migratory birds, you know, who might be coming back, making long journeys back to uh, warmer Britain. So we see chiff chaffs and sand martins um, coming in to, yeah, seek, seek the warmth. Yeah, and speaking about what they're eating as well, insects is quite an important food source for, for birds and we can actually see quite a lot in the garden here as well. So should we go and look for some insects? Let's do that. Perfect. <laughs> So logs like these can actually be a very good place to see what's hiding underneath. Mm -hmm. So shall we have a go? Yeah, let's do it. It is important to be careful when you do this though, to make yeah. sure that you're not squashing anything. Okay, but... what have we got? 
some wood lice. Oh, there's something here. What's this? Oh, this is actually a baby toad. <gasps> yeah, oh, and there's amazing. a baby newt right next to it as well. Oh, so cool. So yeah, even though it is warmer, they're still kind of seeking out these damper conditions that this mm -hmm. log is really quite good for. And wood lice actually are also really quite good for, um, it's a good sign, it's a good healthy sign of a kind of, yeah, a healthy mm. ecosystem. Yeah. because they're decomposers as well, the recycling of nutrients from this dead wood back into the soil to help, yeah, all this growth. Oh, um, fantastic. Oh, we got really lucky there. That's yeah, amazing. Really Should we leave them to it? Yeah, let's leave them to let's it. Let's put so. it back. Yeah. Back how it was. There we go. Awesome. Cool. Cool. And let's get out of here before the gardener tells us off. <laughs> <laughs> So we've talked about how important insects can be for the environment. And one of the things I really love about this time of year is when we start to see the butterflies all coming out. So what kind of butterflies and other insects do we see at this time of year? Yeah, so I also really love butterflies. One of my favorite butterflies is actually the peacock butterfly. And they're quite unique in a way because they're one of the few butterfly species that actually hibernate as an adult. Um, through the winter, so we see these butterflies coming out um, quite early, again taking use of those early flowering plants that I was talking about, as well as, yeah, like you said, pollinators, so bees and um, queen bumblebees and um, solitary bees are the ones to kind of come out first, mm -hmm. and we also see hoverflies using rich patches of flowering plants as well. Mm -hmm. And other type of insects that we can see could be native ladybirds. You might catch a couple, you know, basking in the sun. So yeah, there's a whole variety of different insects that you kind of come across. And it, of course, these are, again, supporting other mm. um, uh, species and animals such as birds who then feed on them as well. Yeah. And now we've got to give a little bit of a shout out to the mammals. Yes. Very important. And my first experience with ever seeing a hedgehog was in a park in the middle of Leeds. Oh, so wow. it's amazing where you can actually find mammals. What kind of things can we find, particularly in urban areas at this time of year? Yeah, so quite a lot of mammals, actually. We, um, of course, have the red fox, mm -hmm. which, you know, is quite prominent in urban areas. They're highly adaptable. And we've actually had a couple of resident red foxes in the museum gardens, actually staying put throughout the development, reconstruction of the museum gardens as well and actually certain species like hedgehogs the gray squirrels they're um, highly adaptable again and widespread throughout urban parks as well mm -hmm. and things as well as uh, pipistrel bats so they use artificial structures tall artificial structures to forage and to kind of rest in mm -hmm. um, and they take use of a lot of foliage and shrubland um, that might be common around um, urban areas and uh, woodland so yeah quite a lot but mm. again we haven't we haven't spotted many today but if you keep an eye out I'm sure that you'll be able to catch them yeah definitely and we've walked around pretty much most of this garden already so I think we should head over to my favorite part of this garden which is the jetty should we head there now that. let's yeah. do it So we are really lucky, of course, to have this beautiful space right outside the museum. Just how important are green spaces like this in general? Yes, so the science is actually overwhelming to show the importance that green spaces have on people's well-being and mental health. So, you know, getting out there and listening to the birds, looking at the different plant species coming in can really do you a lot of good to um, how you're feeling in that day even. And actually, if we're thinking about these gardens particularly, it's really also important for science. So we have been monitoring these gardens for the past 30 years and we've found wow. a whole host of species um, through that time, you know, through the changes in the seasons as well. And um, we've also been monitoring different types of like the newt population, for example, and the different types of birds that are coming in and out. So as well as it being important for us, it's also important, obviously, for the species that it's supporting. And green spaces like these are also really kind of good in terms of connecting different green spaces together because it's really providing a refuge for animals to go from one patch to the other to meet other individuals of their species, mate and really thrive. And another really important part is being in an urban area, especially during the summer months, it can get really quite warm. So the urban heat island effect means that uh, artificial surfaces made out of man-made surfaces can make it kind of absorb more heat and make it quite unpleasant 
garden for a lot of us living here. So actually having a garden or going to your local green space means that you can really enjoy the cooling effects of it uh, when we're approaching the summer months as well. So yeah, a whole host of uh, benefits. Lots of things, yeah, yeah, lots of things that's important. Um, and if people do have like a garden or a balcony or something, they want to try and attract wildlife, is there anything they can be doing to help wildlife come and find them almost? Yeah, of course. And you know, in, there, there is no need even for a garden. Like you said, a balcony is a really good place to even start. You can uh, put up a bird feeder, especially when um, food is scarce in the winter months. Um, and then in the summer months, you can have more of like, um, a, like a, even a jug of water, a plate mm -hmm. with some water for the birds to kind of have a refreshing break in. And if you are lucky to have a bit of green space, you can um, even things like not mowing your um, lawn and letting wildflowers, um, mm. you can really get wildflower seeds very quite easily. Yeah, letting it run a bit wild to um, let all the species come and kind of get um, lots of use out of it. Oh, well, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Shatuki, for showing us this beautiful garden and what we can find and what people at home can also find as well. And yeah, don't forget, if you're watching at home, you could have a local area. There's lots of things that you can see there. So why not get out, explore? It could be a local park. You could have a balcony. You could have a tree outside your house. Go and have a look because you'll never know what you might be able to find. Be sure to join us in the next episode of Seasonal Changes. But in the meantime, you can record nature in your local area and then come back next season to see how things have changed. Let us know in the comments below what's happening in your neighbourhood. And if you enjoyed this video, you can also like and subscribe to this channel for more natural history content.